do a series on Jordan Peterson. So we have meetups every day. And I'm very excited about this series on, um, on meditation. And I'm really grateful to Taylor uh, to, uh, to, because it's wonderful working with her to build this up. Today, we have a special guest, uh, Spencer Carlson, who will be joining us. Um, so today, the plan is um, we are going to discuss the book, Power of Now, by Eckhart Tolle. And the panelists are going to be Taylor, John, Easy, and Spencer. The format today is we'll do a panel discussion on this book. Um, then we will open it up to Q&A. You can ask any questions. There is a chat window. You ask the question over there. After the Q&A, we will have a transition. Uh, Easy will be reading out a poem to move us into the next kind of mindset. Uh, then it'll be, uh, we'll uh, move it over to Spencer. Spencer will be talking about transcendental meditation and he's going to lead us through a meditation. After the meditation, we break up into small groups uh, so that we can discuss what we've learned in a much more kind of free flowing way, right? So that's the plan. So with that, let's begin with the panel. So um, let's start with uh, Taylor. So what, uh, so I'm going to start with uh, Taylor, then we'll go to John, then Easy, and then Spencer. So talk a little bit about what you got from this book before each, each of the panelists. Just first, let's talk about what you got from this book. You know, why this book? Why did you read it? What, what remains with you? Um, and uh, then what we'll do is that the panelists, you, can, you, have, you will have a chance to ask other questions to other panelists. Uh, so that's how we, how we do the panels. All right. So with that, um, Taylor, so what did you get from the book? Sure. So I um, first read this book um, many years ago. I think it was like four or five years ago at this point. And I was really drawn to this book because I thought, and it was recommended to me because it was a really good just introduction to meditation. And I think the language is really accessible. And one of the, something that Eckhart Tolle really focuses now focuses on is right in the top is right in the title like the power of now so it's really he just focuses on kind of how everything stems from the current moment the current moment is all we have and um you know not not dwelling on the past or projecting into the future and focusing on the present is really where a lot of our you know, our, our power co um, comes from. So what resonated with me, um, I guess I'll talk about just kind of like two things specifically that were from the book that resonated with me, um, particularly at the time that I read it, was he tells a story about a woman who he sees um, like in the street, or I think he like saw her originally kind of like on public transit and he, is kind of following the path of this woman they're headed in the same direction and she's kind of ha she has this monologue in her head that she's acting out loud so basically she's talking to her herself so she has these thoughts and she's so identified with those thoughts that she's actively responding to those um out loud and i think that that was just a really good um picture and a really good illustration of the monologue in the narration that we all have and what it's like to be identified with that and not to be aware that if we have these thoughts, then we are not our thoughts. You know, we are, if we can observe our thoughts, then they are separate from us. And if we can identify if we can, if we know, if we can be the thinker and the seer of those thoughts, that's kind of where liberation and awareness um, and what he calls an awakening um, can happen. Is the awakening happens when we separate ourselves from that constant monologue. And the other thing that really resonated with me specifically when I read this book was that he talks about kind of how he got into this work and 
what his shift in consciousness, like the moment kind of like that he, yeah, his like shift in consciousness, his awareness like of his thoughts and his de-identification with the thoughts was that um, he was really um, depressed. He was having a lot of um, suicidal ideation, suicidal thoughts, and he kind of had this moment of clarity that um, was like, was long lasting. So I think too, one thing that this reminded me of, and I'm not well read in this, um, in this particular, in this work that I'm about to like reference, but I do know that um, William James, he's a, I think he's like a philosopher and he talks a lot about um, like religious experiences and kind of these, he's looked at like different um, types of spiritual and religious experiences people have. And so sometimes people like make a conscious decision, like I want to kind of, you know, seek help. I want to change my um, mode of consciousness and my awareness. So they seek that out. And whereas other times people are so identified that it's almost like you're forced to change. Um, so I guess what I'm trying to say with that is that my um, experience and um, what resonates with me from his work is that I also just was so identified with my thoughts that I even kind of like when I think about like the shifting consciousness that I have I remember like this specific kind of like moment now that kind of like launched me into this new path and what William James looked at too was that people who experience this it is like a long lasting shift and one way to compare that is that when you have that awareness and that long lasting effect, it's similar to the effect that if you have a, um, if you're a parent, once you're a parent, you can no longer, you know, you'll always know what it's like to be a parent. Like you never like lose that awareness or that kind of knowledge. So I think with mindfulness, um, meditation and um, what's possible is you can change your awareness of your thoughts in this long lasting way that then is just kind of like a way that you can operate in the world. Uh, thank you, Taylor. Uh, next up is John. John, go ahead. Yeah. So, um, I sort of have an interesting history with this book, uh, because I thought I had read it. <laughs> And then when I went back to read it again, I was like, wow, I don't recall any of this. I must have really like missed the boat. <laughs> and then I realized that I had actually read his other book, which is A New Earth, which is sort of a follow up to this book. And at the time, I didn't really uh, get that much of it. You know, I didn't really, it didn't really, and I, I think the reason is because the power of now is a lot more fundamental. And, and this book actually really resonated with me. And uh, it sort of, when I had read the uh, the book A New Earth, I had at that point I was just sort of doing simple counting the breath meditation, so I knew basically nothing about any more advanced Buddhist teachings. Uh, but now, sort of having gone and, and learned a few things, um, reading this uh, Power Now book, there's a lot of themes that I see in in other schools of thought. Um, but I think the most compelling thing for me about this book was that, um, you know, the the process of awakening is a process, or the process of of mindfulness and the process of of um, freedom from suffering is uh, it's not comp it's not supposed to be complicated. Um, and I think the one thing that this book really does a good job of is explaining it in very simple terms. Because I think, uh, especially in the West, we sort of have this tendency to make things very complicated and to make things into levels, into hierarchies. And uh, it's really, it's really um, the, the, the fundamental lesson for me from this book is it's really about acceptance of the present moment, like really accept, acceptance of, of the way things are and, and not the way uh, we, we want them to be. Um, as 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 a fundamental way of operating through the world and um and and i i yeah i mean i'm really 
I really think that there, this book is a very really great, uh, like, you know, if, if you need to read like one of Eckhart Tolle's books, like definitely this one, <laughs> I recommend reading this one. I'm not, I'm now going to actually go back and read the other book because I feel like this book had uh, more fundamental um, and, and very common sense practices that, that also appear in a lot more advanced teachings. So um, definitely um, an excellent book. And the second, first time I read it was much better. So thank you. Uh, thank you, John. Uh, next up is Izzy. Izzy, go ahead. Hi, everybody. Um, I mean, I, I, there are too many good things to say about this book. Um, it's one of those, I think it's one of those, those pieces of writing where you don't feel like you're learning something, but rather being reminded of something. And, and I mean, Eckhart Tolle does it in a really beautiful way. And I think his, uh, Taylor mentioned his own personal story, which was he was an extremely depressed and um, self-doubting, anxious guy. And from, from much of his life, I think he was, he was even maybe in his 40s when he actually had this, you know, quote unquote, life change, where um, in the bout of a like depressive episode, he found himself thinking, I can't stand myself anymore. And that simple sentence, or that simple concept was enough to kind of basically launch him into this realization that, you know, what, what is the I and myself and why am I separating those two things? And what are those in the first place, basically? Um, and I mean, that's such a, it, it's so relevant to all of us because we have that narrative, all of us, the narrative that is our ego, that isn't really the true the, the true um, core of our being, because that's not the awareness, it's the object of awareness. And I think, um, and basically Eckert's pointing out that we get um, stuck in this cycle of identifying, not with the awareness, which is the basis of our experience as human beings, which is what is our consciousness, what's allowing us to even experience, we're getting stuck on basically the object that's that's basically, I, I think there's a really good way to, to illustrate that, which is that if you are, let's say you're in it's floating in space um, in a vacuum and there are objects just like debris in front of you and you can see them, you, there must be something giving them light so that they're visible to you. So basically, what awareness is could be um, an analogy to, or what an analogy for awareness could be, is that light source that's behind you illuminating the objects in front of you. And I think it's a cool way of illustrating that the ego, like us identifying with these thoughts, oh, I feel this, I believe this, I, I am this, I am Izzy, I am, you know, a woman, I am a person, whatever, all this stuff is not really me. It's just what's in that field of awareness. And, and I think the power of now is so powerful because it's just a reminder that we are, we are not those things. We are just witnessing those things. And it's the most freeing, I mean, and the way he also articulates it all so eloquently and through these very accessible anecdotes and um, stories, it's, it's the freedom of detaching from that identification with this, basically this habit of our mind. And the habit of our mind, of course, that's causing our suffering because it's, it's, it's what's linking us to the external world of, um, I'm not good enough and, you know, I need to meet up with this expectation and expectations in general and I'm expecting the world to be something for me and this person to be, all of that stuff is basically what he's saying is it's all bullshit. And basically we have access to the awareness that underlies all that and that, and where we can actually reside and be okay and be serene and just witness all of it, the good and the bad and the ugly. And it was, uh, I don't know, I, I highly recommend this to anybody who hasn't read the book. Um, and I think, 
it's I think like John said it's it's an easy it, it's not it's not something that needs all these uh this this whole hierarchy of where you have to reach a certain place it's right there in front of us and it's it's so accessible and it's ours basically uh, and I think he's he's doing us all a great service and showing that and not uh pretending like there are these certain kinds of uh hoops to jump through to get there so yeah that's my thought on. <laughs> wonderful thank, thank you very much easy that was great it was great um spencer you're next great thank you so great to be here this is my first time um so great that this exists you know, I have no awareness that these things exist. Um, <laughs> so it's good to be here. Um, I, love, I love the book. Um, my dad actually received the book from a friend of his uh, a long time ago. And he loved it. And then my dad became like, you know, a Jehovah's Witness for Eckhart Tolle. And um, I was drawn to him because I was suffering. I was depressed. I was miserable. I was, you know, at times suicidal and, and, and here was this guy who had the same experience and he was talking about, you know, all the things that all the other panelists have mentioned, you know, so far this de-identification with, with your thoughts, you know, this, this experience of awareness, you know, the ease, the process of, uh, of awakening, of enlightenment, if you will. You know, it wasn't just some like guy who was just so happy all the time, like some bubbling Buddha figure, you know, who is kind of inaccessible, but it was this real guy who was talking about his experience. And it was also really attractive because what he's describing basically is like uh, a sudden enlightenment, a satori, if you will. Like, you know, like he's miserable, he's depressed. And then like, as he was saying, the, the question that he asked himself, um, you know, led to this kind of like sudden enlightenment, this kind of experience, this release, you know, this experience of awareness, of identifying with awareness instead of his own individual nature, his own individual ego, his thoughts, you know, and so he had that. And, and, I, was so, and I was so attracted to that and to people that talk about those experiences because it's like, here I am in my little tiny body, just so miserable, walking around pissed off all the time. <laughs> and just feeling like, just so, just like, you know, and I actually was living in New York City at the time. It's where I grew up, where maybe a few of you are from and are living. And it's just so intense there. And so, you know, this book and his experience, you know, was just kind of like this beacon of hope of, um, you know, that things could be different, basically, and reading about the mechanics of kind of, you know, this process of, 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 of identifying with the awareness, you know, reading about the, how that, pro how that process kind of unfolds in, a, in an accessible manner. Um, you know, it wasn't, like John said, it wasn't very complex, you know, it isn't very complex. You know, it's not, it's not like, like some, some Buddhist, you know, sutta or something, you know, from the Pali canon, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's this guy's experience, you know, and he's very um, accessible and it's very exciting, you know, the idea that like, there is this thing of awareness, there is this possible way to, you know, to be, to not, to not be, you know, suffering, to not be so you know, stressed out all the time, which is really hard to do in New York. That's why I moved to California. So that's also a technique. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Spencer. Um, so let me start by asking some questions, uh, one question to the panel, and then the panelists can ask questions to each other uh, to kind of tease, tease this out. I mean, from whatever you're saying, I have not read the book myself, um, but from whatever you're saying, it looks like uh, it's a very simple idea. It is simply kind of being aware of what is going on now. And it, it seems extremely simple. At the same time, our, the way in which our, um, you know, our 
brain is put together, our habits are put together. We get caught up in things. We get caught up in ideas. We get caught up in emotions. Um, we get caught up in doing kind of habitual actions. And we are not aware of the now. We're either thinking kind of stuck in the past or kind of looking at what's going to happen in the future and not paying attention to the present. So, so two questions. So what, is it true that it's, it's kind of, it's a very simple thing. Um, and secondly, why is it that people don't do it? What is, what is it that stops people from focusing on the present? So anybody who wants to answer, you know, any, any, any of the panelists, you can take it up and go from there. Go ahead. Um, if you don't mind guys, uh, I think what stops us from having access to that all the time, um, is a deep primal, basically a, a requirement for the ego. And I think, uh, he does acknowledge this, that if, if we were to awaken completely and be perpetually in a state of awe and you know, residing in this space of awareness, we would wither away. We wouldn't, we wouldn't eat, we wouldn't drink, we would, and I mean, people have done that. People have, have gone to that place and simply died. And, in, in, you know, in this, fr in kind of a free way, because they're residing in the awareness and letting their physical body basically disappear. But I think the, the main idea is that we're in kind of a constant at least this is my thought, we're kind of in a constant uh, battle between what we know to be true, which is that we are this, we are witnessing all these things and between, and between the part of our brain that has to continue its functions and its functioning and, and, the, and maintain the body in order for us to stay attached to the external. So it's this weird, I mean, like everything, it's like a paradox of, of just being a human, of, of being in this universe, which is paradoxical. Um, and I think, I mean, for me, it's, it's good enough just, to, just to, uh, to, to have something where you're acknowledging that part that we so often ignore, especially in our culture. I think John touched a little on Western culture and the kind of things that we're indoctrinated to believe. And our culture is, is fix, fixated on maintaining the ego so that we stay attached, that we stay consumers, that we stay, you know, constantly engaged in thinking and, you know, ourselves, our, you know, our beliefs and our opinions, all this stuff. So in, in, in so many respects, we don't really have access to even the knowledge that there is something more than that because we are so primed and we're so enculturated to buy into the, what Eckhart Tolle is, is telling us, the lie that we are the ego and we're not. Um, and I think the reason why we, we, don't, we, stay, we stay this way is, is not only because, well, like I said, I think it's the, the, the deep level, the evolutionary level, maintaining the self because we are, we are animals, we are you know, trying to survive. That on top of, I think, a persistent uh, kind of indoctrination uh, by the culture, the culture surrounding us, that um, that basically requires it requires our ego to survive as well. Um, so yeah, I think I don't know if that answers your question, but thank um, you, <laughs> thank you, uh, Spencer or Taylor. Um, okay, um, I yeah, I guess one thing that I was I was thinking was or when you asked the question was that, and Izzy mentioned this too earlier, that it's really just a habitual pattern of our minds. So in that, that habit pattern, like any other behavior we have, is very difficult to break out of. And although, um, you know, all the panelists have touched on this, that it's, like the answer is like right in front of us. The answer is just ex like radical acceptance about what's happening and just in awareness of our, our thoughts and our reactions to that. But 
also, I think when we're, when we're approaching this, you know, shift in this type of mindfulness to have that awareness and that kind of ease that it is a difficult process that you, we've been reacting to our thoughts and maybe even, you know, not even aware that we have these thoughts that we're reacting to. I remember like when I realized that I had my, I was reacting to my thoughts, like that was like a radical thing. I was like, oh my gosh, like I cannot believe like I have these thoughts in my head. And you know, for the past 25 years, I've been reacting to them. I mean, experiencing that and really knowing that for yourself is like, it's enough. And like when you, how you become to real, how you come to realize that is not kind of entertaining the distractions that you otherwise would um, entertain. And if you entertain those distractions, you're missing the awareness, I guess. And okay. if you, and by doing that, it's a difficult process that we don't always, you know, it's un sometimes it's uncomfortable to face that. So I think that's why it's kind of like the easier method is just to do what we've always done. But like the long-term results really come with the patience in um, just remaining aware. Thank you. Um, so Spencer, why do you think it is so difficult to be aware of the now? Stress. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because like when we're, you know, like Thich Nhat Hanh, you know, who maybe some people know also is just another kind of, you know, mindfulness, Vietnamese mindfulness monk, um, who like has written many books. Anyway, he said, you know, he says a lot of things, but like, you know, when you do the dishes, just do the dishes, right? And that's like, you know, that's like this, so what we're talking about. But like, you know, when you do the dishes, what happens? You have thoughts, you know, you start planning, you start worrying about the meeting that you have tomorrow you start and it's like oh i've got time now i can think you know i've got time to plan you know so it seems like it's useful you know time to do that thinking process but then maybe you have like a, a mindfulness practice or something like that and, and you're like oh wait a minute take not on eckhart toll says to just do the dishes oh, i'm just gonna do the dishes but then the thinking starts to happen again and you know then it kind of pulls you out of that of that now experience which is really what Eckhart's book kind of you know is all about is about cultivating that ability and that you know familiarity with inhabiting the present moment and just making that kind of experience more um like readily available but i think that you know stress plays a huge role in and the ability to be mindful, and that's what meditation is does, is it reduces the stress. Thank you. It reduces stress. So when you're so when you're when you're too stressed, you have lots of thoughts, and when you're not so stressed, you don't have as many thoughts. Mm -hmm. You know. Yep. So thanks. Like that. Wonderful. Thank you. So now, uh, panelists, um, Taylor, Spencer, John, and Easy. Would you like to ask any questions to the panel? You can just go ahead and unmute yourself and ask the question. Anybody? John, Easy, Taylor, and Spencer, would you like to ask any questions to the panel? Nope. Okay. So in that case, I'm going to go to the questions from the audience. First question is from Jeff. Jeff, go ahead. It's going to be Jeff. Michael and Caroline, and the rules are very simple. Uh, what you do is that when you're called upon to ask a question, um, just unmute yourself, ask the question, and then mute yourself back. Um, keep asking questions. We'll have, we have time for questions, so you can keep typing your questions in, and I will come to you in order, okay? So Jeff, go ahead. Uh, thank you all for doing this. So. Um, I've sort of been in and around Tolik for a, a long time, and uh, it's good to stop and, and really consider his perspective here. So I, I have a question for you. So, um, yes, being is, is essential, and yes, being here and now is, is essential. 
to peace and clarity and so many things. Do you think that Tolle uh, considers that anything in and of itself, of course, in the here and now, is actually good or bad? It's a really good question. Um, I think, I mean, I don't know I, uh, his personal moral, you know, compass. You know what he what he deems good and bad in the in the I guess external world. But I think just the judgment. I think he he might say is um, it's not founded in the actual, you know, infinite, you know infinite expanse of awareness so good and bad um uh, name any other polarity i guess um i think all of it falls under um it, some sort of attachment so some sort of idea of what um reality is that that isn't actually um the underlying reality of basically the way that i would that i would um perceive that is you could say the natural world and the universe is neutral. Like it is human beings who assign the labels good and bad, ugly, beautiful to the various things in the universe. So in that same sense, I think um, one couldn't really say that, that something is objectively good or bad. It's just a matter of uh, the subjective human mind projecting that onto whatever object it is that you're deciding is good or bad does that does that kind of answer well to, to, to take it out of theory a little bit and ask it in a way that is you know a little bit more pointed um mm -hmm. so is somebody physically torturing somebody good or bad if somebody stops torturing somebody and you happen to be sitting right there is that good or bad just just as a, as an example. Um, so, uh, he just, he sort of talks about this. So one of the things I really like about this book is that um, it's, it's, it's written in the form of questions. So he's taking questions from people he's taught over the, over the years and he's sort of compiled them in the book. And these are, he, the, the questions he chose are some really tough ones. And, and a question pretty much like this comes up, I think actually several of them. And he basically says, you know, well, well should I accept a circumstance that is, is, you know, harmful or physically abusive? And he says, well, you don't need to accept your your circumstance, but you always need to accept the moment. So when he talks about being now in acceptance, he's not talking about accepting, you know, evil in the world or or people doing harm. And he says that uh like you still so there's certain circumstances you still need to act. Like uh it's not that you just let everybody do whatever they want around you and punch you or <laughs> Uh, but the the idea is to 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 always accept the moment, to to accept reality and be in the present moment. So when you feel pain, don't try to to don't try to hide it away, right? Don't try to pretend it's not there or distract yourself. Also, when you need to act, you know, if you need to deal with the situation, you can do so, but you don't necessarily need to become the situation. So, you know you you can you can still act skillfully and not necessarily with uh anger or hatred um and and in this way he he's when he talks about acceptance he's just talking about the world as the way it is right and 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 doing what sort of acting with what you 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 feel is is moral and just and and will lead to the least amount of suffering but not necessarily identifying with that negativity or wanting to change wanting to try to change things that you can't change so in, in that sense it's almost very stoic um very good. is that 
Does Thank that help you. answer your question? Uh, no, let's, let's do one thing. Let's not do too many yeah. follow-ups. Let's not do yeah. follow-ups because there are lots of people with lots of questions. I want to be able to get to as many questions as possible. Um, next up is going to be, it's going to be Michael, Caroline, Kyle, Logan, and Eileen. So Michael, go ahead. Okay, um, I don't know much about Tole, first of all, so uh, this is very interesting. Um, let's see, I've, I've certainly run across the concept of, of uh, not getting too caught up in things and being focusing on the now, and I, I've sort of learned to do that to a reasonable extent. Um, and, you know, reading books like this might be helpful in doing that further. Of course, something that people often recommend is uh, having a meditation practice as well. Um, where does Tole fall on that? Where do you guys fall on that? And, uh, you know, the intuitively spending, say, 30 minutes a day doing that is, is a big time commitment. If I can just reread the book a couple of times and get a bunch of them to you know, like intuitively get there without doing too much meditation, that would be appealing. <laughs> so where do you guys fall on that? And where does Fold totally fall on that? Thanks. Well, first of all, Michael, your, your, your image, your background image is probably the best one I've seen on any Zoom call. Carl Lagerfeld with, with, <laughs> with a matching dog, it's perfect. Thanks. Um, but uh, yeah, with meditation, I mean, to your, I was reading your, your question. Um, you know, if you feel that it's too much of a commitment, then you shouldn't do it, is my take. You know, if it feels like a strain, if it feels like, if it feels like too much, you know, you shouldn't do it. And I think, you know, with some people, there can be a feeling of like, well, I should be doing it. Everybody's talking about it, you know, like that. And, and, and but you know, if there isn't that feeling from your side, then, you know, then no, no worries at all. But I think, you know, in reading something is, in, is about the intellect, you know, is about reading is, is, is that intellectual comprehension, you know, but when you meditate, you know, it's kind of, it's not an intellectual thing. It's, it's more about awareness. It's about experiencing deeper levels of our of ourselves of our experience and so it, it it kind of you know transcends that kind of you know chatter of the mind even when we're reading things and comprehending than than about just sitting quietly and experiencing some calm and some some inner stillness you know that that you really can't get from from other activities especially with kind of eyes open um eyes open things so there's definitely a great benefit to, to meditation, you know, many, many benefits that have been scientifically proven. Um, but again, it's just a matter of, you know, your, your level of, of wanting. Next question is from Caroline. Caroline, go ahead. Hi, um, I was wondering if Tole ever speaks to easing suffering. Like, does he imply that, um, the antidote to emotional suffering, like anxiety and depression, is to just to be in the now purely. And as such, I guess the second part to that question is, does he ever speak to spiritual bypassing? Can you, uh, can you define spiritual bypassing? I haven't heard that term. Um, sure, so I guess, um, what I could have said to explain, to elaborate further is like, sometimes we're told to feel our feelings and that can be a way of healing in of itself. But um, spiritual bypassing could be like, instead of looking at what is really here, it's like using um, a meditative practice to kind of go past it without actually seeing it, if that makes sense. So instead of feeling the pain of, or the sorrow or whatever, meditating and and but instead of going within you're kind of you're going away from yourself it it, mm -hmm. it would it, it seems like you would be going within but if you're actually maybe going more into the theory of meditation than the practice itself okay so it's like sort of like an intentional dissociation yeah, of yeah. Like a, okay 
Thanks. Huh. Did any of you guys want to answer that or? Okay, I mean, if, if, we, if we can't answer it, that's fine. We can we'll just go to the next one. I can and take we'll a, be... a crack at it. Sure. Um, yeah, so I mean, this is actually a pretty core part of the book. So um, I, 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 I'm gonna take an anecdote from like some other, um, another teaching I received that basically talks about the same thing, but is the same idea. And that, um, you know, a teacher told me that, or told a lecture said that, um, you know, uh, pain, Pain is inevitable. It's sort of like part of the gig, right, uh, of being alive. But suffering is optional. Um, and so, what what happens? What suffering is is really an aversion to pain. It's sort of like a hiding of pain. And so, uh, to answer your question, um, he definitely doesn't really he doesn't address spiritual bypass. But it, what he's what he's sort of teaching is not definitely not. It's not like an object of, of meditation uh, or some special sort of um, talisman to, to sort of uh, imagine your pain into. It's really just, ex it's feeling, feeling the moment fully and accepting it. So if there's pain in that moment, um, you, you actually feel it, you process it, you let it, you let it sort of work its way, its natural course, rather than sort of push it off and, and, and let it linger. Because that's, that's often, that's really a lot of, of the cause of suffering is our, our aversion to our natural inclination to avert, uh, avert pain and our society's uh, clever and clever mechanisms for achieving this, which really doesn't actually um, uh, extinguish the pain. It just sort of uh, moves it into other places. Thank you, John. Um, next up is Kyle. Kyle, go ahead. Hey there. Um, so I guess my question kind of piggybacks onto Michael's. I'm just curious if after reading the book and seeing kind of the benefits of like presence or mindfulness, um, if you guys have actually developed a meditation habit that you still have in your life now. Um, yeah, that's basically my, just my quick answer to, or question to the three of you guys. So uh, let, let me just uh, answer them for, uh, answer the question for them. Uh, each of them have had very extensive kind of meditation habits. So some of them like uh, Taylor, for example, has gone to like 10 day meditation camps, maybe seven to eight times, and then has a daily practice. John has a practice for his own. Spencer has a practice of his own. Um, and what we are going to do is that we're going to look at kind of various meditation practices in this series. So what we'll do is that we'll do one special meetup just on that of kind of kind of discussing because kind of developing a practice is, you know, it's kind of you have to kind of tailor make the practice for yourself. So, for example, something like a 10 day retreat really shakes you up because it's such a long time of doing the meditation that it's a great way of actually shaking up the patterns that you're used to then there can be very short, but you can't do it too many times. <laughs> you know, it's not practical to do it, uh, you know, too often. So then you develop kind of smaller meditative practices, which help you maybe within a few, even few seconds, you can do things which can help you, like, for example, focusing on the breath, things like that. So each of them have very complex. And each, the reason I'm giving this long answer is that if I let them talk, they can talk, each of them can talk for an hour on, on what their meditation practice is. So we will do special, special meetups for that. All right? Okay, very cool. Yeah. Thanks for answering. Thanks. Um, next question is from, so we are going to take two last questions and then we are going to move on to uh, Spencer talking about transcendental meditation. Uh, no, uh, after these two questions, we're going to have Easy talk, uh, you know, recite a poem. Then Spencer is going to talk about transcendental meditation. He's going to lead us in actual meditation. And then we're going to break up into um, the breakout rooms. Okay. So um, with that, so the last two questions were, are from Logan and Eileen. So Logan, go ahead. Logan, are you there? I think Logan was responding. I, I, I'm pretty sure he was responding to Michael. Okay. All right. So um, Logan is not here anyway. So uh, let's go to uh, last question. It's for uh, Eileen. Eileen, go ahead. Hi, Hi everyone. Um, you can see it's not really a question. It's like a statement of 
is this what you're talking about? Or is this what effort was talking about when you say to be present in the now? Because it seems like you have to suspend the momentary now that follows where you are at the present. So there's like no, cotton, I don't want to say continuity, but uh, it just seems like you would just stop and be a human being and not a doing. <laughs> Instead of a human doing, you know, you would just be with everything. Mm -hmm. But it seems like you, you have other purpose or you have obligation. Or, so where does the actual um, being present, is it really every moment of the day or your life? I guess that's part of it. Well, just comment on the nature of that concept, you know. Uh, that's a great question. Um, okay, uh, who would like to take a swing at it? Go ahead. I'll take it. Um, yeah, I think that what you said is 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 exactly right. And to build on that, you know, you said something about is should we really be present every moment? And I think the answer to that is what when you're it's what Spencer said, like when you're doing things when you're planning your day for tomorrow, you're, you're engaging in like intentional thinking. So you're doing that task. And then maybe, you know, you have intentions to plan your day for the next day. And then you have another thought that comes in about, you know, some other distraction, a piece of mail you need to respond to. So you've set an intention to plan your day for tomorrow. So it's, you know, the awareness and the presence is about, this is my intention, this is what I want to be doing right now, and I don't have to keep continually responding to these other thoughts they are gonna take me away from what it is that I'm doing. So it, so it is also very practical to um, be aware in this way and to, to operate in this way. So, you know, when you're walking, if you don't need, you know, if you're not walking with the intention to plan something, then you should just be walking with the awareness of what it's like to walk. What does the, you know, what do your feet feel like in your shoes? What's the weather? What's it, does the sun feel like on your face? So I think it's just about like, when you're working, you know, we, we I think, or hopefully most of us right now in this room have um, a job. So if like you are doing that job, giving your full attention to that job, and then re recognizing when your thoughts come in that you don't have to be taken away from them. So it's, it's very practical. Thank you. Thank you, Taylor. All right. So now um, it's on to Izzy and the poem. Izzy, go ahead. Oh, okay. I'm not muted. So this one is, um, this one's by Mary Oliver and it's called The Uses of Sorrow. Here it is. Someone I loved once gave me a box full of darkness. It took me years to understand that this too was a gift. Thank you. Thank you, Izzy. Um, and Shrikant, do you, do you want to move on to the meditation or? Uh, if you want to say something about the poem, you're welcome to say that. I was, I was going to ask if how you guys, um, respond to the poem or feel about it. But if we don't have time to, to cover that, it's yeah. fine. Yeah, what we'll do is that what it does is that it, it just provides like, a, I mean, the, it provides like a meditative way <laughs> of kind of thinking about it. Let people, let that percolate and maybe we can carry that on. We can talk about the poem when we go into the breakout rooms. So okay, I awesome. make sure that there is enough time for Spencer to Thank do his stuff. Spencer. Go ahead. You're now talking about transcendental meditation, and then you're going to lead us on uh, in a meditation practice. Go ahead. Great. Um, this has been so much fun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know about everyone else, but I'm having a good time. Um, yeah. So I've 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 done a lot of different types of meditation. You know, some stuff that is in line with what we're talking about with Eckhart Tolle, but I've also in 2012 learned the TM technique, Transcendental Meditation, which is uh, an effortless uh, mantra-based meditation 
uh, it's done 20 minutes twice a day. Uh, so even more than 30 minutes, Michael. <laughs> um, and, and it's a very, and it's a very effortless technique. It doesn't require any kind of, you know, dropping of the mind or any, any kind of fancy maneuvers of the mind. And, uh, it basically just takes, you know, the mantra that, that you're given and you just, you know, repeat it to yourself, slow, you know, slowly, effortlessly. And then the mind just settles down gradually to natural, deeper kind of depths, you know. There's like an ocean and on the surface of the ocean is kind of like where we have activity, all the individual waves, you know, in our daily life. And then this kind of what we're talking about, about awareness and about coming into the present moment is kind of like going beneath that, you know, experiencing finer levels, deeper levels. You know, but with TM, you know, as a, as a practice, it's just this very natural, gradual, effortless experience of experiencing the kind of deeper levels until you get to the transcendent, the transcendental kind of level and, you know, many kind of different uh, traditions talk about this, you know, in different ways, um, you know, pure being, pure awareness, awareness itself, being with a capital B, you know, all of these things. And it's just the experience of, of unboundedness, the experience of, of feeling really at peace and calm. And what TM does is that, the, you know, when, that it, when you have that experience and you meditate and you transcend, then you experience, um, you know, stress release. What happens is you, there's a process of going down and then you have a thought, the thought pops you back up to the surface of the ocean. And then that thought gets expressed as, as, as a release of stress. And so it's like that over and over again of kind of diving deep, popping up, diving deep, popping up. And once you do that, you know, kind of daily, which is really important for a daily meditation practice, whether it's TM or something else, is that it allows you to experience the stress release and also experience the finer levels of, of the mind. And, it's, and, and then experiencing those finer levels influences the activity during your day where you experience calm and then you bring calm into your life, you know, like that. And so... The ner our nervous systems and our, you know, in our body are all, you know, are very kind of agitated most of the time. And we have very activated nervous system. Like when you're anxious or you're worried or you're fearful or something frightens you, you know, you can feel it in your body. You know, you take too much caffeine, too much coffee, whatever it may be. Your nervous system is kind of activated and heightened, you know, it's, it's stressed out. And with TM, there's this cultivating of the nervous system, de-stressing the nervous system. And when your nervous system is able to be less and less stressed and stressed out, then you're able to kind of be more calm, have better precision of thought, better, um, you know, more precise actions. Your actions are more powerful, you know, and, and, and all of these things. And so, um, so yeah, I learned in 2012 and I, and I, and I learned it and, and I did it for a little while. And then, you know, I kind of stopped doing it and, you know, it wasn't until kind of recently within the past couple of years that I returned back to it and have been doing it now twice a day, um, you know, for, for many, for many days. And, you know, the benefits are, are, are very palpable. Um, you can always go to tm.org. Um, if you're interested, and um, you can learn a, a lot more than I'm telling you about it here, um, about it there. And um, let me see, what else? Um, yeah, it's really, it's really kind of, it's life changing, you know, and kind of, you know, about Michael's question, because, you know, at, at the time, I didn't want to do it, you know, I was like, ah, oh, it's, you know, it's not that important. I'm, I, my life is okay. I'm having fun. I'm in college, life is great, whatever, you know, but, and so I didn't want it. And then it was on, it wasn't until I got kind of depressed, you know, and, and, you know, where things started getting bad that I started realizing like, oh, I want to do this meditation thing again to get rid of this bad negative feeling. You know, it's like you kind of wait till you, wait till you get, you know, a little, you know, 
round, you know, from eating too many sweets until you want to kind of like do something about it. Or, you know, you kind of wait to, you know, oh, I'll just wait, you know, until later, you know, wait till later. And, um, and so the benefits that I've received from, from this practice have been just like innumerable. And it's, it's actually, in my, in my experience, my belief primary to all the other things in my life. This comes first. And then all the other things in my life are increased as a result of it. And I think that's true with all meditation. Not everybody that kind of meditates will tell you that probably that life is just enhanced. Life is just better. Life is more fun. It's more enjoyable. Um, you know, and that's, that's the benefit of meditation. And um, yeah, so it's, so it's very, so it's very, um, it's great. It's just, it's just great. And um, yeah, we can just Thank do you. a very quick, a quick Please. Thing. Yeah, go ahead. And it's not TM because TM is, there's, there's, it's very important to be taught by, uh, by some, a, a teacher, um, you know, and like there's a whole lineage and tradition and everything. And it's very important. So we can't do something like that. But what I do want to do is you know if you have your uh, like a phone or something you know you can set it down but if you're on a computer and you have both hands available great that's that's what we want so what we'll do is just like you know kind of you know i'll watch the time and everybody can just you know enjoy that um we'll just do kind of like a a, a breathing exercise but what what i what I, what I want you to do is i want you to take your right hand and I want you to place it on your diaphragm, you know, and it's kind, of, it's kind of below the rib cage and above the belly button, you know, right where the kind of rib cage meets the belly, you know, and so your diaphragm. And then take your left hand and put it on your chest and, um, you know, like your sternum area. And then just, you know, you can close your eyes and just experience that you know, you know, taking breath in through the nose and breathe into your, into your diaphragm. And just notice that you can, you can experience just the, the rise and, and fall of the diaphragm. And so, you know, so what we'll do is to just breathe in through the nose, experience the rise of the diaphragm, and then exhale, you can open your eyes actually to look at this, look at this part. <laughs> So to just to just almost like purse your lips and exhale through your mouth. So like that, but don't don't force the breath. Just let it come naturally. Just easy in, easy out, easy in. So you know you can close your eyes again and just breathe in through your nose, through the fill the diaphragm. Exhale through the mouth. Feel that release of the diaphragm. And just repeat that. Just we'll do it like for three minutes. And I'll watch the time. Now bring your attention to your left hand. Feel that calmness, the stillness of, of the left hand while you're breathing.
Okay, just release that and open your eyes. Great. And so you notice that the right hand with the diaphragm is that rising and falling, is that activity. The activity. And then the left hand, when you bring your awareness there, it's the heart and it's still. There's no rising and falling. There's that stillness, there's that calmness. And this stillness and this calmness, that is that is the mind, that is the experience of, of, of some peace, some calmness. So there's activity and also stillness, also some calmness. So I don't know what you want to do, Sri Kant, but we can invite some experiences okay. or something. Okay. What? Uh, okay. So what we're going to do, uh, folks, is that now we're going to just sit tight. I'm going to divide us into small groups, mm -hmm. so we can have a much more kind of intimate discussion uh, without having to go through this process. So give me just a second here. Thirty-three people. Thank you, Spencer, by the way, that was great. Great. Spencer, that was great. And everybody on the panel, that was amazing. <laughs> Okay, um, so you are going to get an um, invite to join a breakout room. Just go ahead and accept it. And we are going to be there for about, uh, about 23 minutes. We will end this at 10.30, all right? So see you in the breakout rooms.